they need, uh, in terms of determining priorities, they need an SDR that looks in absolute depth with great clarity at three aspects of defence and security policy. Firstly, homeland security. What does that mean in an era of international and global terrorism? What does it mean in terms of a cyber threat, which is very real and underestimated? And what does it mean for a United Kingdom, which is going to be increasingly dependent on imported energy sources? That is absolutely vital as the, the plank on which defence and security policy must sit. Then a proper analysis of what are our vital national interests. I don't mean by that the degree to which we leverage defence for the sake of exports or finance or whatever. I mean, what are we tied into? I mean treaties, NATO, etc. And I mean the prospect of um, looking after our dependent territories and indeed evacuating our peoples. Uh, what, 7 million uh, Brits um, are actually resident abroad, so it's a significant number. And thirdly, and here's the difficult one, what is an appropriate place in terms of discretionary action for the UK to sit on the world stage? And that is an aspect which I think we have not truly grappled with, and we didn't truly grapple with it at the end of the Cold War in Options for Change, and uh, I know I was one of the people attempting to do the grappling, but we now have a much clearer view of what the world is like. I mean, you know, are we returning to economic bipolarism with China on one hand, US on the other, uh, against the backdrop of, um, of failing states as we see in Somalia, Afghanistan, etc. And what does the UK want to do? How much blood and treasure do we want to invest in that? And that is the aspect that needs deep and careful analysis, because from that, so much else flows. So when you mention so much else flows, that would be decisions such as Trident, aircraft carriers, etc., or is that further down the line? Well, you could describe those three aspects uh, of homeland security, vital national interests, and uh, where we sit on the world stage as three circles, and bisecting in the middle, you could say, well, if we put all our money on Trident, that'll be the right thing to do. And in terms of the ultimate insurance policy, I guess that's right. But it will... Uh, it will determine questions to be answered on expeditionary capability. How much, how far, how long, those sorts of questions were never adequately answered before. I think uh, in terms of priorities, the next government should look uh, very coldly, very coolly, very objectively at what the interests of this country are in the future. And if they look at that, they will see that it's a globalised world that is unevenly globalised. Uh, we're going to see all sorts of pressures, um, all sorts of um, um, attacks, actually, on what I call the global commons. What are the global commons? That's space, that's cyberspace, that's the sea. And the sea, uh, as I've said many times now, is the physical manifestation of the World Wide Web. Everything that happens virtually happens for real uh, between countries, between states and entities um, uh, on the sea or over it. And I believe that we should put our investment into those things that reinforce our economic and diplomatic instruments of power uh, that also enhance our ability to exploit and benefit from globalization. Uh, and so we need agile forces, those that can provide us with high impact, possibly low footprint forces that can actually go and do military tasks rather than uh, stabilization tasks in very uncertain theaters with very uncertain mandates. I think we have to go back to what was very good logic in the 1998 Strategic Defence Review, and that is we said we will protect our home country and we'll protect our wider interests through an expeditionary capability. And we were configured very well for that before the Iraq and Afghanistan campaigns. We just weren't resourced properly uh, to transition to an expeditionary capability. But in a globalised world, we need to have a globalised capability that is capable of intervening in a time and place of political choice to our economic and diplomatic advantage. Well, the challenge, I think, will be to match that level of ambition with the capabilities required to fulfil it. And, of course, the thorny question in difficult economic circumstances of funding the deductions you have come to uh, and there are, of course, uh, big questions out there. We, we know what they are. Um, 
helpful. Uh, perhaps the most obvious one here is the two new aircraft carriers, which are without doubt in the centre of, of a global and intervention role, in that you can take air power wherever you want it. You are not beholden to this or that country to allow you uh, two miles of concrete uh, as a um, land base. Um, so the, the, there are these uh, bits of litmus paper which I think when dipped into this water will start to tell us uh, which way uh, we are going. For myself, uh, I am a carrier man. Um, I accept that there is an expense there. So perhaps worth saying, not so much the ships themselves, big though they are, but the real expense is, of course, the air group that goes on them. And an aircraft carrier without, air, without aircraft is not much good to anybody. I'm not saying you, you could have an intervention capability, uh, capability without aircraft carriers, but it would not be in the same league. So these are, these are the big questions. Um, and I think the other dimension to the Strategic Defence Review, which is a difficult one to call, is um, what sort of conflict. In my um, service, we, we fought three conventional wars, the Falklands, and in the shorthand, Gulf I, Gulf II. All three were short, pretty sharp, and militarily, decisive. Mm -hmm. I say militarily because now is not the, the time to debate it, but Gulf I can be seen as militarily decisive, but not politically decisive. Um, and you add up the time taken for those three conventional wars, and it's a matter of weeks. But we've been doing for years operations other than war, in one form or another, the Balkans, Sierra Leone, Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban, Iraq after the fall of Saddam Hussein. Uh, and there is a big debate to be had here. Uh, is this exclusively the nature of, of future conflict? Or do we still need to maintain the national insurance policy of a conventional war fighting capability? Mm -hmm. I'm of the second of those schools of thought. Yeah. 